Hello again. So this is the introduction to lecture two on integrated circuits and ESD. So the goal of this introduction is to really give you a soft introduction to integrated circuits, what you need to start thinking about, and also bring up a topic that if you're actually gonna make an integrated circuit, you have to think about, and that is electrostatic discharge. Now the project that we're gonna try to do is you are going to try and design an integrated uh, temperature sensor that will have a digital output. And I really hope that some of you may actually get to a tape out. That would be really, really cool. Now it's possible to do that with just open source tools uh, and with Skywater, uh, but it's not trivial. It is a significant amount of work. So let's see. But when we're gonna test the temperature sensor, you sort of have to start to think through what do I need on the chip? What I need, what do I need from the system in order to test the thing I wanna test, which is the temperature sensor. So what I want to try and think about, and we'll discuss further in the lecture, is what it is actually that the chip needs to include. Of course, it'll have your temperature sensor, but what else? Now the way to start to unravel the type of blocks that you need is simply asking the questions, how does that work? So we know we have a temperature sensor. Maybe you don't know yet what's inside that, that you will figure out, but you can sort of assume that there will be a ground pin, there will be a VDD pin, and there will be a digital output. Now the digital output is probably multiple outputs, like a bus, or maybe it's in a time domain. So it's a single output where the digital value depends on the temperature as a function of time. But how do you connect that to the real world? How do you measure it on something? Maybe it's with a microcontroller externally, or you're measuring with an oscilloscope, the digital signal that comes out. But try and think through what must be there what must be on the chip? Now, there is a challenge that is always there when it comes to integrated circuits, and that is electrostatic discharge. Most designers won't have to worry about it, but a few designers will spend their life on this. They will focus on it every day and make sure that the chips that we make in industry actually survives during and after production of both the chip and the uh, printed circuit board and in the end when you sell it to customers that it still survives under normal operation. For example, a mouse like this. How do you design a mouse like this such that when I touch it, it doesn't damage? So there is books, actually there's not books, there is a book <laughs> I know of, and that's called the ESD in, in Silicon Integrated Circuits. It's, um, well you can buy it, and uh, if you remember Wiley, which I think into new was for a while, you can actually download it also. And there are standards for how we test electrostatic discharge, but we can sort of group them into uh, a couple common models because when we're gonna simulate something, then we have to have a model. We have to have a way to make sure that whatever we create actually will work. Now, most of the focus for integrated circuits is before or during we actually mount it on a PCB. When it comes to what happens after, then it's slightly different and, and it's more uh, system level ESD concerns and well, still some human body model but for IC, it's human body model that we use and also something called the called charge device model. Now these try and model two different phenomena. One is electrostatic discharge that just happens 
because somebody's touching your chip, and that is the human body model, while charge device model is trying to simulate or emulate what happens if you have a chip in a strong electric field, for example, on a production line, and it's sort of going through the, well, for example, reflow station, and maybe there's a plexiglass window, and that plexiglass gets charged over time, uh, which means that when the chip is in this strong field, it would will uh, redistribute the charges inside to cancel that field. But we'll focus on human body model today. It is probably the easiest to understand, and it is also the easiest to deal with, as long as you remember to do so on the chip. Charge device model is, for complex chips, can be very complex. It is not necessarily easy and it's handled through strategies for how different power mains are separated and connected. Now, <coughs> imagine a person, I don't remember the height, let's assume 170 centimeters, standing and with an outstretched arm and touching your chip. Now we model that by a capacitor of around 100 picofarads and a resistor about 1.5 kilo ohms. Now this capacitor we charge to extremely high voltage. Now that's usually charged to I guess triboelectric charging just walking across the floor either picking up or giving away electrons. So it's what you experience in the grocery shop when you touch the door on the um, cooler and you get a small sap. Th that sap maybe can be, well, if it's an air gap sap, maybe it's a one centimeter gap. And then we're talking kilowatts for the air, air to ionize and break down. But these type of pulses, it sort of acts like a current source that just gets pushed into a pin. And the duration is relatively long in the sense it's uh, around 100 nanoseconds. It'll start out fast and then it will slow down. And this we can usually handle in the input output uh, parts of the chip. Now, depending on what level of ESD protection you want to have, maybe it's one kilovolt or two kilovolt HPM, but for four kilovolt HPM, it's actually equivalent to about 2.67 amps getting pushed into your chip. And that is usually quite a lot higher than the normal operating current of your chip. So what happens? So imagine we have our chip and also imagine that this chip is not powered. So it's not connected to anything, which means that it's fully okay to ground the VDD and then push a current into the VSS. And that's sort of the inter interesting thing about ED ESD design is that you can no longer trust what is up and what is down in your circuit. VDD could be, v could be at zero and VSS could be at a high voltage. So what type of circuits can we put in to protect the device from these saps? Now we'll look at a couple of them. Now, if you want to simulate this, you can always do that. You can hook up this in your spy simulator and you can see what happens to the current as you sort of close the second switch here. So you charge a capacitor first very slowly and then you discharge it relatively fast. Now, when I say you can simulate it, that is partly true. You can simulate it if the spice models of the circuit actually support it. But let's look at three conditions. So we have a ground pin on, on our device, we have a pin, this could be a random input, and we have our VDD. And if we go through the permutations, then we could sap from zero to one, which means that uh, one is at the ground and zero is the current that we're pushing in. And we can sap from one to zero, zero to two, two to zero, one to two, and two to one. I think that's all the permutations for this set. And for all those different conditions, we have to have a circuit internally that can handle these really high currents of amps. Let's start with the first one. 
So let's imagine that somebody pushes a current into our ground and we want to guide that current into VDD because current will always flow in a loop. Now in this case, we could actually just use a diode because in normal operation, this diode will be reverse biased. So even if I have VDD at a high voltage and VSS at the low voltage, that's fine. This diode won't conduct, well, it won't have that much current. It'll have a leakage current given by the, uh, I guess the saturation current of the, uh, the diode, but that's usually quite small. But then under the sort of abnormal condition of pushing current in the ground and then leaving again from the VDD, then this diode will be forward biased and it will safely guard, it will safely lead the current uh, through the IO ring or, or through the outer parts of the chip and not into our temperature sensor, for example. We can work through the other combinations also. And uh, for the second one, for example, if we ground the pin, we can do the same thing. We can push a current into ground and it will go through this diode. So now I've marked this with 02 just to show where the current flows. Now, ESD designers will make sure that the layout of these are done direct correctly so they can actually handle the current. And then you have to work through all the permutations. And here you have to trust me a bit. When I say that the type of circuit that you see here now is something that you commonly find in older nodes. And we can see the 01 current is in this diode, the 02 and the 12. So when we sap from high current in on VDD to two, in this case, we actually use a weird circuit, this NMOS. You can use different things here, but usually it will be something that looks like this. And this is part of the question today. How does this work? But what will happen if you make this correctly is that for a one to zero pulse, so putting a, pushing a current into one, it will be led to ground. And if we sap from one to two, then the current will flow in here through this transistor and then through this diode out to the pin. And we can see the other conditions for two to one, then you just flow into the pin and out through VDD. And for two to zero, it will flow through this device again. But now I ask you, with the, all the knowledge that you have about MOSFETs, transistors, and MOS. Why does this work? Now, the brave ones can try this in the simulator and see what happens. And I'll go through in the lecture how it actually works, but I really want you to think through this. Try and figure out how this works. How this works. It's kind of fun. It's... It, the reason I find it fun is it sort of brings together everything that you've learned in the past four years with band diagrams and PN junctions and all the solid state physics. There's a second strange phenomenon that I want you to know about and that is something well, actually, it comes in the next slide. But I should mention that for, for this thing, if you just do this with a random NMOS and you lay it out and you try it, it will it's guaranteed to be damaged. You actually have to do the layout correctly. Now, in order to understand how you should do the layout, you actually have to understand how this physically works. What is the sort of uh, physics reason for why this NMOS works? And if you don't do it correctly, then you get pretty pictures like this where you can actually see something called current filamentation. And that's an effect of high current flowing and actually extreme temperature increase locally. And in the end, damage. Now, I mentioned another phenomena. And that's this. So, 
imagine a scenario where you have your ESD protection, for example, and you're running a current out from the pin, 100 milliamp, or something that is not, it should be well below the current capability of this diode. And then sometimes what you can see happen is that if you have an inverter relatively close to this, and suddenly you can trigger this structure, this inverter structure somehow, and there will be a short circuit current from, from the VDD and down to ground. Now this only happens for structures that are close to pad. I, I don't have a good number on it, but let's say 100 micrometers from the pad. So something in the physics happens here to, to really trigger this. And, and this is actually interesting because this is permanent until you drop the supply. So if I do apply this 100 milliamp and trigger this thing, trigger this event, then and then I remove the current, then I'll still have a short circuit from VDD to ground. And that short circuit will continue. Short circuit will continue until VDD drops, or the battery is depleted, or <laughs> the battery catches fire, or insert uh, horrible thing here. But how can this work? How can sort of the current in one place lead to a current somewhere else? That's what I want you to consider. Now, just to point out that when it comes to ESD. There are experts out there, so if you don't know how to do this, you could always g contact Sofix. They uh, specialize in ESD structures, but it is something that has to be handled. Uh, quite often also from the foundry, you will get guidelines on ESD. Now, the funny thing about ESD is I've found over the past 20 years that not that many people actually understand the physics. They understand that something happens, but they don't necessarily know why. And if you don't know why, then you'll base your knowledge on empirical data and not necessarily make the right conclusions and not make the right design de decisions. So it is extremely powerful to know exactly what happens because you can make predictions. You can make predictions on how, for example, you should change your layout to make sure that these structures either survive the current pulse or the, the current pulse actually doesn't happen. But in order to do that, you really have to understand the device physics. Okay, see you in the lecture. Bye-bye.